Jesteśmy w Newcastle upon Tyne, największym mieście na północy Anglii. W tamtą stronę już jest tylko Szkocja, z wieloma wspaniałymi dystylarniami i chyba jedną miodosypnią. Ale nie tam się dzisiaj udajemy, udajemy się do najmniejszego miasta na południu Anglii, ale chyba z największą miodosypnią. Miejmy nadzieję, że ten fakt uda nam się dzisiaj zweryfikować. Także za chwilę ruszamy, ruszamy koleją, ale z uwagi, że jest wczesna pora, ja jeszcze śniadanie jadłem, a wiadomo, że gwarantem sukcesu jest dobre śniadanie. Idziemy zobaczyć, co możemy tutaj kupić. Za mną znajduje się Grex, najbardziej popularna piekarnia na wyspach. Firma, która powstała tu na miejscu w Newcastle Apple w 1939 roku. W 1951 otworzyli pierwszy sklep i obecnie jest to największa sieciowa piekarnia właśnie w Anglii. Wyprzedzają sprzedażą McDonalda czy inną sieciówkę taką jak Subway. Serwują tradycyjne angielskie bułki, chleb, sandwicze. To za chwilę pokażemy, wy zobaczycie, a my skosztujemy, także wchodzimy. Witamy, siemano. Małe sprostowanie, a może raczej wyjaśnienie. Mówiliśmy, że jedziemy do najmniejszego miasta w Anglii, a jedziemy do największej aglomeracji, czyli do Londynu. Co się udało nam dowiedzieć? Londyn sam w sobie, London City, to jest jedno z mniejszych miast Anglii. Liczy zaledwie 7 tysięcy osób, jednak cała aglomeracja to jest już nawet 14 milionów ludzi, także robi wrażenie i tam jest ta niedosytnia, którą chcemy sprawdzić. Tak. Co, śniadanko? Śniadanko jak najbardziej. To poopowiadamy troszkę o, o British Cuisine, a później może pogadamy trochę o innych. Tak jak mamy przy sobą trochę 3 godziny podróży. Także, no. Także tak jak widzieliście na filmie wcześniej, zaopatrzyliśmy się w Brexie. To jest wspólne. Mój jest z sosem, eee, mój jest tutaj. No, a mój jest tutaj. Czy możemy powiedzieć o angielskim śniadaniu? No, mam nadzieję, że kiedyś nam się uda pokazać wam takie prawdziwe, prawdziwe full English breakfast, jak będziemy mogli sobie gdzieś tam spokojnie usiąść w jakiejś restauracji czy w knajpce. Natomiast dzisiaj mamy taki English breakfast na wynos. Bułce, na wynos. I co tu mam? Eee, bułeczka dosyć miękka. Eee, to zaznaczy, że to nie, jest jak, nie są jakieś rarytasy. To są po prostu najbardziej popularne eee, dania, które są zarówno w przystępnej cenie, które za naprawdę za przyzwoitą cenę można się dobrze najeść. Bułka zwykła, z białego pieszywa, mamy angielską kiełbaskę, która często jest mocno przyprawiana, bekon, bekon jest bardzo, bardzo charakterystyczny tak. dla angielskiej kuchni, no i tu mamy omlet, czyli jajko i ketchup, który często jest nazywany w Anglii red sauce. Alternatywy może być brown sauce, czyli... No, w Polsce nie ma brown sauce, ale takiego... No troszkę bardziej taki... E, od stoby można powiedzieć. Tak, e, jest taka dosyć duża tutaj rywalizacja właśnie między tym, co powinno się używać na przykład do... ...śniadania, czy brown sauce, czy red sauce. Co jeszcze udało nam się ten? E, bo bułka, jak bułka do bułki można wszystko mieć. Ale to już jest coś, czego w Polsce chyba e, się rzadko spotyka. Pastry? Pastry, czyli generalnie ciasto francuskie, w Polsce bardziej kojarzone pewnie z, z jakimś, nie wiem, słodkim, wiecie, grzebienie, czy, czy tego typu rzeczy. E, natomiast w Wielkiej Brytanii bardzo popularne jest właśnie takie pastry, ciasto francuskie z nadzieniami e, słonymi, słonymi, savory. E, w tym chyba masz kurczaka, jeżeli się nie mylę. Tak, to, to jest. Ko kurczak z żółtym serem, takim raczej z sosem serowym. Ciasto jest bardzo kruche, proszę zobaczyć. To jest świeżutkie, dopiero dzisiaj rano wypiekane. Ale uwierzcie mi, że takie pastisy, bo tak to się pozostanie tutaj mówi, są równie dobre na drugi dzień e, zimne. 
I tam wkładają wszystko do środka, zarówno wegetariańskie, wegańskie, akurat pastry, pastry, pastry rybnych nie ma w Grecji, ale również są jakby większe opcje, które często są serwowane jako obiad, tak? czyli to jest taka duża paj, to się nazywa, czyli taki placek, który również jest właśnie wypełniony często wszystkim, co było z dnia poprzedniego. Paj, to jest dobrze, że tak w sumie zacząłeś o tym. To jest typowo właśnie taki brytyjski wymysł prawda, w czasach średniowiecza, tak. jeszcze za, za, za Henryka VIII, wiem, że jak odwiedzałem właśnie pod Londynem e, e, Hampton Court, mhm. tam jest jedna z największych kuchni, e, zachowana taka jeszcze w dobrym stanie i tam dużo ciekawostek się właśnie dowiedziałem o, 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 o kuchni brytyjskiej. Także generalnie paj sam w sobie był dlatego wynaleziony, e, żeby po prostu ugotować posiłek. Także często w przeszłości używało się tego pastry jako, jako naczynia, w którym gotowało się ten posiłek, a niekoniecznie się je jadło. I tak jak wspomniałeś, tak, to na może być to taki duży paj, duża taka micha zrobiona z ciasta, wypełniona różnymi dodatkami, bo to jest właśnie czy steak, czy, 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 czy nerka, e, grzyby różnego rodzaju i tak cokolwiek. dalej. Cokolwiek może być to włożone, zamknięte ciastem, zapieczone w piecu i później taki paj się wyciągało, tą górę się ściągało, środek się wyjadało, a bardzo często tą całą resztę po prostu się wyrzucało, czy tam zwierzęta zostawało, czy cokolwiek. Mamy też dzisiaj, my jesteśmy mięsne jeże. <głos> Mamy tutaj steak pie, czyli to samo, ale tutaj bardziej jest taki widzicie, ciemny sos pieczeniowy, dosyć gęsty, Wołowinka. z wołowinką. I ostatnia rzecz, którą dzisiaj zakupiliśmy, też bardzo popularna na wyspa, tak zwane sosy roll. Sosy roll. Kolejne francuskie ciasto, zobaczcie jak ono się pięknie kuszy tutaj. I w środku jest ta tradycyjna angielska kiełbaska, która no, nie jest jakaś tam rewelacyjna, e, aczkolwiek taka sosy roll jest stosunkowo tania i łatwo ją zjeść po prostu szybko e, można zjeść na ciepło, na zimno A to już jest piosenka nowa, nie? Z żolu? Z żolu? nie? We build this city We build this city on a small city I w tym momencie koniec Dobra. Zmierzamy do Londynu pociągiem, bo to jest chyba najszybszy transport w Anglii. Większość połączeń obsługuje Londyn. Tą trasę, która liczy... Jakieś 450 km spokojnie chyba, nie? Dobre, no. Dobre, 450 km. 450 km pokonamy w 3 godziny, a w samochodem zajęłoby nam to do dobre 5, przypuszczam. No, pewnie tak, może 4,5 jakby były dobre, dobrze na trasie, no ale to też nie dojechałbyś do centrum pewnie, bo tylko gdzieś do obrzeży, a no, do centrum pewnie mogło być zająć drugie tyle. Dokładnie, dokładnie. Londyn jest strasznie rozbudowany. Pociągi, świetna sprawa w Anglii, czyściutkie, ciche, szybkie ale też niestety drogie. Relatywnie drogie. Nie? Relatywnie drogie. Taka porada, jeżeli się wybieracie do Anglii, to zdecydowanie warto jest kupić bilet z dużym wyprzedzeniem, to nawet do 12 tygodni. Wtedy te ceny są troszkę tańsze. I szukać różnych promocji na bilety. I też taka ciekawostka, kupowanie biletu powrotnego zawsze jest tańsze niż kupowanie biletu w jedną stronę. Czasem tak naprawdę bilet w jedną stronę może kosztować tyle samo, co bilet w dwie strony. Także tu jest taka troszkę przeszkoda, gdyby ktoś chciał na przykład podróżować od punktu A, B, C, D w Anglii, a nie tylko kursować na jednej trasie. Także... A trzeba szukać, kombinować niestety. No. Także tak powiedziałeś, pociągiem Banon, Banon jedziemy <śmiech> dla, dla tych, co znają barwę znańską. Ko kolej w ogóle zaczęła się tu w Anglii. Kolej rozpoczęła się tu w Anglii zdecydowanie. To były to był początek chyba XIX wieku, koniec XVIII, początek XIX wieku. Eee, też pierwsza lokomotywa właśnie była wynaleziona właśnie w, w Anglii, notabene. Newcastle, eee, z którego ruszyliśmy. Newcastle, tak, w północno-wschodniej e, Anglii. Eee, to był taki parowóz, chyba się nazywał Rocket. Rocket to były, tak, w ogóle pierwsza, znaczy pierwsza lokomotywa komercyjna, taka e, skonstruowana przez George'a Stevensona chyba w 1830 roku. Rewolucja przemysłowa zaczęła się tu właśnie na północy z Anglii, z której ruszyliśmy na południe do, do Londynu. Także. Także pociągiem przez Anglię w celach jodowych.
Goose nail? Ghost nails. Ghost yeah. nails. We have problem how to actually properly yeah, spell. I've, I've, yeah, some some people try some quite uh, different variations, uh -huh. but uh, so it's Gosnell's. Gosnell's. Yeah. And that's name come from the, the from name? Tom Gosnell. Yeah. So the founder um, and and director Tom Gosnell started in about 2013. I think he started the company 2013, 2014, and uh, yeah, put his name on it. Uh, we probably thinking is the biggest one of the biggest midri in England definitely on the am amount of honey what they buy did you agree with that yeah I think yeah there's, there's probably us and maybe two other big producers in the UK but uh, yeah we're all sort of around about on the on the same level mm -hmm. we sh soon we're gonna show how big is midri you get a <laughs> yeah. surprise yeah big, big and leaders not so much in uh, floor space uh, just tell me what's make you different because you kind of different midri in, in UK than all others. What, yeah, what is so, that? so we focus a little bit more on, on hydromels and that sort of lower ABV meads and uh, you know focus on, on, on honey and and just be a little bit more uh, accessible to people. So mm -hmm. sort of focusing on creating a mead that for, for people who haven't tried mead it's not too, uh, too strange, you know it's not too different from cider or beer or, or wine. But for the mead lovers as well, it's it's a different style of mead as well. It's it's a little bit lighter. It's still honey forward, but it allows us to have a little bit more experimentation with it as well. Sparkling, yeah. Yeah. So Most usually we do sparkling. Yeah. So our, our our range sort of breaks up between our our four cans and our 5.5 bottles, which are all sparkling, to a little bit of sort of barrel work and, and high rate BB stuff. But yeah, mainly focusing on the the sparkling hydromels. So session mead, in, session in, mead, in, in, short yeah, mead, short, you know, yeah. whatever you want, it, the thousand names that you could call it, but yeah. yeah. So what's the ABV for the strongest one? What you made at the moment? So the strongest mead we ever made, we did a, a twenty percent mead, 20, 20 and a half percent. Uh, that's very strong. What kind of yeast? You uh, so we're it? using uh, WLP zero nine nine, so a White Labs <laughs> mm -hmm. um, a high grave yeast. So stage nutrient feeding, stage sugar feeding, and then we use that there to create a, uh, a different style of vermouth. So instead of doing uh, you know, like a standard wine where you would uh, put in either an NGS or even like a, uh, a distilled wine itself and raise that ABV up and, and fortify that way, we decided to, to brew really high up and then um, aromatize, so adding all the spices and stuff into it and then dropping it down to about 16%. Uh, during that sort of process, so that, that was a fun one. But that's that's the highest ABV yeah, we make. Otherwise, generally we stick about four to five and a half percent. Mm -hmm. So that twenty percent one was that just like a one-off, or is it something? Yeah, you it was, got, like... it's something that we'll uh, when we have a bit more time we'll get right. into because uh, it's it's a lot of fun. But there's we we wanted to uh, we want to make everything from honey. Right, we got some boxes actually on front of us, and we got. Four main meats. I will. Yeah. I can call that as a main. Uh, main yeah. So this meat. is our can range is probably our 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 core. We do we do have a five and a half percent straight meat as well, which we do in seven fifty ml bottles, and that's our Gosnells of London. So that's our orange blossom honey, five and a half percent. That was our one of the like the first recipe. Um, but these are our our four percent cans. So we do a hopped, uh, which is a dry hopped uh, session mead. We do a hibiscus, so we only use uh, hibiscus flowers, so technically it would be a, a metheglin or a methaglin, depends how you want to go about that. We do a citrus sea, which is uh, done with tarragon, lemon peel, uh, sea salt and hops. So uh, that one there, it's a blend of citra and cascade. Um, so that one there actually has a cool story at the start because it was, uh, used to go drive uh, Tom's car, Tom used to drive down to Cornwall, get um, seawater, bring it back here boil it in the kettle and brew over the top but as we're sort of grown it's uh, it's a little hard to get you know 10,000 litres of, of wow. seawater okay. from Cornwall up here so we end up moving to to sea salt and doing it that way and the last one which is uh, my favorite is the sour which is a mixed fermentation um, sort of a play on an oxamel so it's using uh, a little bit of acetobacter so an oxamel is uh, using vinegar and, and honey and vinegar and wine or vinegar and mead uh, so this has just got a little slight bit of vinegar with uh, a lacto fermentation and also uh, a standard mead fermentation. It's all going to the primary fermentation? So they're all three different fermentations and then all blended together. Blended together. Yeah. Because I want to ask for salt if you don't mind to come back for that. Uh, when you use the salt water, I never heard someone do it. That yeah. Like seawater. Uh, 
how the yeast working with the such so a you, salty... So you would have to pasteurize it, and uh -huh. in a salt environment, yeast is usually okay. Mm -hmm. um, you usually use salt to uh, sort of keep out, um, you know, when you do like a lacto fermentation or something like that, you'll, you'll brine to be able to keep away other microorganisms to allow the lacto in that sort of area. So some yeast and some bacteria really thrive in a salty environment. Oh, it I, does I, add a stress and it does slow it down, uh, which is why we now add the uh, the salt at the, the end of fermentation. Because that's that's the most, mostly what people do. If they add salt or kind of salty product, you add for the end. And when you said about... Yeah, that, that's what was, was like, really Whoa. cool about when I was reading that <laughs> recipe and the development I went through, I was like, that is not anywhere near a recipe I'd ever developed, which was, uh, it's always nice to start somewhere and go, that's cool, why? Why, yeah, why not? The rest is the history. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Because <laughs> the idea of Midris come from Tom, yes? Uh, yeah, so yeah. He's, he's not with us here today, but yeah, sadly. how he get to the meet? Because so, of, of course, I believe he got some idea and then he find you as a head brewer. So there was two, two head brewers for me. So the company's been running for about seven years now um, and I've been head brewer now for just over two or nearly three. And um, he started off uh, sort of making cider and a little bit of that. and. He went to into the states, uh, just uh, going around, and he discovered, um, sort of discovered me there at um, Maine Mead Works. It was one of the places that he always talks about that really made they made a dry white wine style mead, and I've had it since then, and it is incredibly different to what your perception of mead would be. It's it's bone dry. It's still it's treated like wine. It's 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 long aged and. You know, it's it's a very different culture in, in, in Maine as well, where it was, he sort of explains the sitting down and it's, you know, in the morning with brunch with a big glass, like a wine glass with meat in it. And he was like, it's just, just incredible. And he come back here and started playing around with recipes and he decided that he wanted to make it sparkling and a little bit more approachable like cider. And uh, yeah, then he spent two years trying to develop this recipe, lots of uh, exploding bottles and you know, trying to work on pasteurization. He didn't want to sort of focus on, on sulfiding and going down that sort of route. He wanted to do uh, bottle conditioning and yeah, that was that was a difficult sort of journey. So from, from your story, uh, Tom was the first he head brewer in the... Yeah, yeah. So he, oh, the first recipe that we uh, developed the cans upon and that the 5.5 was, is his recipe. Right, um, it's, still, it's still running. It's still it? running. And like every head brewer's had their, uh, their little uh, play on it. Um, and me and the head brewer, when I started, uh, we moved from the 330ml bottles into the 750s and we moved from bottle conditioning on that product to uh, forced carbonation and putting into a conditioning tank with flash pasteurization. And that's where we sort of found the best version of that product and we've kind of just left the recipe for now. So we, we worked on that after that. So the, these are my sort of adaptations of that base recipe and uh, yeah. And that's that's where we are now. And obviously, you're quite happy with the with the final product. I think, yeah, as uh, it is at the minute. It's one of the things I always say as a head brewer is I'm never happy with a recipe, and there's no such thing as a perfect <laughs> recipe. Um, but these are amazing. So a lot of these I, I adapted from 5.5s with a couple of new recipes on top. So the citrus seeds we talked about before was one of those five and a half percent recipes using seawater and that, and we sort of developed that down to uh, using sea salts and and uh, you know, bottle conditioning those to how we do it now in cans where it's it's 4%. The flavor profile has changed a little bit, only on the citrus sea, surprisingly. It's got a lot more tropical. It almost comes out like lychee, where before it was a lot more anise and the, the tarragon seems to be the uh, the driving force. Soon. Tell us uh, more about how people can get that meat, because you based on London. It's, uh, well, it's not on yet, but it's still gonna be like kind of meat garden, I believe, yeah, yeah. Uh, with the tap bar. Uh, okay, so if you're Londoner, you can find so this you place. Can, uh, so you can find us, we're, we're in Peckham, um, you can find us, uh, uh, we ship all over the UK um, via our website, so it's just gosnells.co.uk and we, we sell our cans on air, we also sell everything else that we sort of make as well and we do some online tastings and we do some, some pairing stuff as well and we do lots of events and, and educational pieces about teaching people about bees and, and honey and, and meat as well. Um, you also you're, you're also import exporting uh, outside the UK. Yeah, right? so we're we're in about 16, 17 countries at the moment. So we're 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 in Singapore, uh, South Korea, uh, Taiwan, um, 
United States. United it's quite States. Big yeah, I so heard for we're, you, in yeah? The, we're in the United States. We're in uh, Total Wines in in, uh, in the United States. Uh, so we're in sort of 48 states and and about 200 stores, which is amazing for us. You know, that's they'd be able to to go to such a, a well-established meat community and and see whether or not we're you know it's it's quite easy to uh, taste your own product and and go like. You know, it's, it's amazing, but it's really nice to get it out to a lot more people and get the feedback and go, okay, you know, what do you guys think about what we're doing? And, and yeah, Absolutely. we're on the Isle of Man and we're in, uh, <laughs> uh, we're in uh, Iceland as well now, which is just kind of cool. So we're, we're yeah. Uh, what people think when they taste meat? Uh, so, um, so if they taste meat for the first time, a lot of people uh, think that uh, it's going to be it's going to taste exactly like honey and it's it's when you ferment something it the characteristics change it's same as like you know eating an apple versus apple cider you know there's there's certain characteristics in there that remind you of apples but you've got that that acid profile you've got the uh you've got the aroma that plays into it especially like uh tannin structure and and these sort of things that that you don't the complexity you don't get from the fruit that you get in the fermentation so a lot of people sort of either think I've had meat before, you know, it's thick, it's alcoholic, it's, it's, you know, it's a little hard to drink. It's like whiskey, but without the ABV, you know, it's, I'm you know, sorry, I'm, I'm laughing because we, we've heard that story, you know, from pretty much every meat maker and uh, everybody who is in, in that industry. You guys, you know, you're not by yourself. <laughs> you know, it's just repeating the story, you know, it's just, it's just common misconception and education is a key. Thanks, James. It was nice of you. No uh, tell us uh, where exactly your honey from. So uh, it depends on uh, on what we're making. Um, you know, honey honey is so, such a beautiful medium. It has so many different uh, variations to it. So we'll start off with with the cans. Uh, so with the cans, we use a mixture of uh, a, a polyflora and a uh, polyblossom. So it's uh, EU and and UK honey. Um, and we, we create a, a blend across so that we can keep a, uh, a very standard flavor profile. So we work with a company that does the blending for us. So they have a, a honey taster there and they blend to a specific characteristic. And then we purchase from them for our cans to keep that consistency. When you're making uh, a hydromel like that and you're creating you know, 6,000 liters a week, you want that consistency in the honey to be as consistent as honey can be. So. Um, we then move on to uh, the 5.5 where we use an orange blossom honey. So that comes from Valencia in Spain and it's a monoflora honey. And then that there is same sort of thing. It's blend, blended across uh, multiple different um, uh, 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 orange blossom honeys. Um, so then we, we sort of get that blend together as well and we make our 5.5 from that. Um, then when we start to move on to uh, our more premium sort of higher ABV or even just our more premium range We then work with UK honey UK producers and small beekeepers So we do a program called the mid the month which was uh, either monoflora honey Single origin or single beekeeper honey and that was keeping the fermentation the same But allowing the honey to be the variable in each recipe So the idea of that was to show people that honey is not only really really cool it is hugely diverse in its flavor profile. It depends on what the bees have been eating, it depends on what the weather's been that year, or, or how, you know, um, what flora is around, um, the urban environment versus the country environment. Um, you know, all these sort of things influence the final product of mead, and we really want to show people what we found cool about mead, and that's the honey, and that's what we're so, so focused on. We, we also did, we also do a, a vintage mead as well, which is a 12% uh, lightly sparkling mead made from the same hives in North London, so urban honey from uh, Woodbury wetlands and uh, the Hackney marshes. So it's these sort of local, <laughs> local, local London. Yeah, it's a 45-minute train ride wow. from here, as local as you can get in an urban environment. Yeah. But um, <laughs> what we wanted to do with that was we work with uh, a company called Local Honey Man, which work with lots and lots of small producers to help them uh, to give them a road to market. You know, it's quite hard when you're a, a small producer of honey to be able to spend the time to get out there and and sell your honey, especially if you start to grow or have you know leftover honey. So. We, we work with them to get the same same hives every single year. We produce it in the same method. So we do 
uh, a production with our house yeast, which is a which is a lager yeast that we've sort of cultivated over the years, um, which is what the cans are based on, which is what all our low ABV generally outside of our like small batch program and some of our specialty range stuff will play around with yeast. But um, we take a, we do that up to about seven percent, and then we use a red wine yeast to cannibalise it and push it up to twelve percent, um, and then we bottle that. So that's that's raw London honey. Um, we don't uh, we do very little um, filtration um, and then when we go to bottle we do none at all so you'll see in the bottom of the bottle it's it's yeast but it's also propolis it's 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 wax it's it's you know, bits of bee you know it's bee products, yeah. you know and and for me that's when i look back at at, at, at mead as a, as a history that's what mead would have been it wouldn't have been this boil the honey and it just throw it in there with some water and all that sits to the bottom and you're not going to waste it. When you get down to the bottom, you're just going to be drinking a, a, a little bit of wax and a little bit of this. And it really shows that it's it's a it's a raw, natural product. It, it's, it may not be, you know, as consistent or as clear as some meads, but there's something about it that really drives home the story that this is part of, you know, bees are so integral to our environment. And and this is this is what it is at its rawest form. But, but yeah, that's... Cool. that's cool. That's how we work with honey. That's our that's our love. Okay, so we in Midri now. Uh, as you saw, it's not big. For the <laughs> Amod honey, what you use it, it's actually very small. Yeah. That's your fermenters up there. Uh, could you tell us a little bit how big they are and how, how often you change the meat inside? Uh, so these are all the 1000 liter uh, FEs. Um, these square uh, tanks are pretty cool. So we sort of, uh, well, I, I sort of retrofitted um, some some old dairy tanks uh, just did water into into brewing tanks so we have you know, I'm not a big person I can touch the ceiling so um, we don't really have a lot of space in here for that so we had to sort of design a brewing system to fit to the space um, we had we started off with the two speedles you see down the back very typical wine tanks dish bottoms um, very easy sort of tanks to use um, and then we moved uh, into these, which means I had to get a new CIP arm to get make sure the older corners. I have to have a big enough hatch as well. So that was one of the, the, the things about choosing that style of fermenter is that we do a lot of um, additions in primary. Because we make hydromels and we, we run a fermentation for about seven days to produce 4% or 5.5%. So from usually from, uh, from honey to, uh, to bottle takes about 10 days. Um, and that's that's with carbonation in bottle as well. Um, so we needed uh, a tank that we could actually add hops to and be able to you know, add tea, let's say, which is one of the ones that, that I quite like to use, but um, you need to have extreme control over when you pull that tea out and when that tannin structure is is ready. You know, um, it's very easy to, to over overdo tea in a me. So I wanted to be able to create Number one, a, a tank that fits in my space, a tank that I can uh, use for adding primary ingredients, and uh, a tank that uh, that is kind of cool and different. Um, and I think we sort of achieved it with the, the little thing down. We can produce uh, when we're fully running at about a thou uh, about six thousand liters a week. What about barrel aging? Do you do with barrel aging? So we do. We we uh, we only have three barrels at the moment. Um, we've got a couple of uh, our older barrels gone out for some some whiskey aging to have a play with that. Um, but uh, we do a lot of barrel fermentation, a lot of barrel aging for um, especially our higher ABVs and also our small batch program. I come from making a lot of weird and wonderful drinks, and uh, I quite like the the oxidisation during fermentation. It doesn't work for every style. 
but I really like doing, especially mixed fermentation uh, in, uh, in barrel uh, and allowing it then to age on its own leaves for, for six months before racking into secondary and, and working where I go from there. The other thing that makes us a little bit different is that we use pasteurization over sulfiting. Um, or, or um, stabilizing using pasteurization is probably a better way of, of stating that. So we started off doing bath pasteurization. So when you bottle condition, um, you need a way of stopping that fermentation. So uh, unless you're doing a dry product when you know exactly what your, your um, FG is gonna be, your finishing gravity, you want to be able to have good control over um, shelf stability. Um, so we started off with bath pasteurization, which is exactly as it sounds, taking a, a, a sparkling product, a live product, putting it into a, a, a big bath of water at a pasteurization temperature, so above 60 degrees C, time over temperature, and uh, stopping the fermentation that way. So we started off with that, we still use that for our vintage range, we still use that for all our sort of uh, more specialized products, but our the way that we sort of use for our cans is um, we pasteurize through a flash pasteurizer. Now it is got tools and stuff over it, because I'm actually currently replacing the pump um, but this is like a giant boiler run a, against a um, like a like working like a plate chiller against a boiler we can do about a thousand liters an hour through this here um, and we do uh, that we do about two thousand liters a day um, when we are in full swing so we do we brew two thousand liters a day we pasteurize two thousand liters a day so that you can do that with one person if you really struggle, uh, really push, sorry, but you struggle to keep that up day in, day out. But uh, usually we brew three times a week, 2,000 liters a day, and then we'll do the same sort of pasteurization. So one person does pasteurization while the other one's brewing. And as you can see, you kind of learn how to dance over each other in here because uh, there's not a lot of space. Let's talk about, let's talk about cans. That's your cans before label. Uh, how you how you label them? So with uh, with the small batch program, we, we do a lot of uh, hand labeling. Um, we do have a labeler up the front, but that's usually when we're doing a thousand liters on big bottles or a thousand liters of cans. Um, it's it's a labor of love. Um, it's you know we do sort of four five hundred uh, batches, but it's called a small batch for a reason. You know, like every single aspect of it is is looked after us, and it's our our recipes, our development, and it's probably the most fun that we have creating these these weird and wonderful recipes. But um, we do them all in-house canning with a little single single can hand canner with a, uh, a little uh, single can filling gun as well. Um, you know, that's uh, the next thing on my list to get is a counter pressure filler, um, but in all, all in good time. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a simple process. Cans make it a lot easier for us to pasteurize as well. Thank you, Will, to have it. It was a great pleasure. I always enjoy to visit any midri, but uh, first and only one midri in London, that's a big thing. Uh, you're real passionate, but we always get the last questions for mead makers. Yeah. It's a weird question to the mead maker. If you could decide which person in the world now or in history you could drink mead, who gonna be? Oh, God. I, I Doesn't have to be historical. Could be oh, like no, you know, fictional see, as well. I was a history teacher, so oh. I. Uh, God, who would I? And who why? Would, <laughs> who would I like to drink mead with? Oh my God, that's like I had. I struggled to do that. With, like, which musician would you like to sit down and, and, and have a conversation? Well, with? It could be a musician. Who, who, who would I like still... to? You know what? I I would really like to sit down and have a mead with Aristotle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go deep. <laughs> yeah, it's so hard. Like, yeah, well, that, that, that'd be, yeah, for me to have a drink with somebody like that and just. Uh, well, yeah. I'm glad we've thrown you out with at least one question. Well, mine should be a bit, a bit easier. If we, let's say, decide that beer it's like a popular music, wine is a classical music, what sort of music is, is mead? Oh. <laughs> you said it was going to be an easier question. I just no, said, said it was so, so difficult for me. To... <laughs> what sort of? I think it's a little bit. Uh... It would be like doo-wop. Doo-wop. 
What's the doo-wop? Sorry. Uh, so doo-wop is like, <laughs> a, uh, like a, a, a 1950s harmony. Um, you know, it's a little bit sort of... Um, uh, it's it's uh, almost childish in its sense, but it's a beautiful musical expression of um, of uh, people's love for music. And I think that that's what kind of Mead has is this this history, but also when you taste it, you kind of feel uh, uplifted and you feel a little Best giggly seeds. and the, the sugar's <laughs> there and the interest is there and the, 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 the musical depth is there. But also when people look at it, they go, if you don't understand it, you kind of laugh at it. And that's what doo-wop is. Like, you know, it's it's that sort of like, and it's like, okay, no, it's definitely not like that. I don't sing. I, I'm, a, I'm a drummer. So, but um, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, can be quite easily overlooked. But if you get into it, it's, it's actually a lot of fun and really beautiful. Great. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much for that question. Thank you. Answer. And guys, see you in the next episode. Don't forget to subscribe and give us a like if you like if you don't, don't like give us this like it's always help on the youtube <laughs> anyway <laughs> see you in the next episode bye tak nasza wycieczka w prawie dobiega końca bierzemy teraz metro na stację i wracamy do Newcastle pociągiem nie wiem czy wiecie ale londyńskie metro było pierwszym metrem zbudowanym na świecie przewozi 3 miliony pasażerów dziennie także tak naprawdę sporo i ten, kto opanuje system angielskiego metra, londyńskiego metra, poradzi już wszędzie na świecie. Także miło było dzisiaj z Wami tutaj w Londynie. Do zobaczenia następnym razem.